Well, good afternoon, and welcome to the first Invention to Innovation webinar series. We're glad you could join us. My name is Mike Paulus. I'm director of Tech Transfer here at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And we chose this series as a way to share with you new inventions that we think have commercial promise and hopefully make connection with future commercial partners who can take these ideas that our scientists and engineers have come up with and turn them into products that can have economic benefit for the nation. So I'd like to begin with a little bit of an overview about the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Can you the next slide, please? Oops. Uh, before we go, I'd like to remind you that if you'd like to send questions during the webinar, you can either text or email to ttpd at ornl.gov. A little bit about the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So as you may know, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory was born of the Manhattan Project of World War II. And in fact, we began our life as the builder of the first continuously operating nuclear reactor. This is the graphite reactor. Uh, this reactor was built in about nine months. It lasted for about 25 years. And for a period of time, was the only source of isotopes for the nation. The thing I like about this as a representation of the National Lab is it began with the very earliest of science, with the development of nuclear reactions and how to take that technology and turn it into something useful, all the way to something that was commercially deployable. Beside it, you can see a chemical processing plant that was a prototype for the one that was used in the Hanford site. To the right, you can see uh, an area of the lab that was called the Isotope Circle. For years, Oak Ridge National Laboratory was known as the place where you went to get uh, radioisotopes that were produced by reactors that could be used commercially and scientifically. Uh, today, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory has a budget of about $1.4 billion. Uh, we have 4,400 employees and an additional 3,000 research guests who join us each year. Uh, the laboratory is home to the world's most powerful open scientific computing facility. It also is home to the world's most intense neutron source. Uh, we have a world-class research reactor. We have the nation's largest portfolio of materials research. We also have the nation's most diverse energy portfolio, and we're the manager of the U.S. contribution to the International ITER project. The Oak Ridge National Laboratory is managed by a collaboration between the University of Tennessee and Battelle Memorial Institute called the UT Battelle LLC. And this is a contractor that was created solely for the purpose of managing the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, we're assisted by members from regional leading educational institutions on our board of directors, including Duke, Florida State, Georgia Tech, NC State, uh, Oak Ridge Associated Universities, Vanderbilt, the University of Virginia, and Virginia Tech. Now, if you look at our mission today, it's come a long way from the uh, Manhattan Project days. Uh, today, we have a mission of delivering scientific discoveries and technical breakthroughs that will accelerate the development of energy solutions and global security. And you'll see in addition to it that we're also uh, responsible for creating economic opportunity for the nation. So the expectation is that as a result of the research that our scientists and engineers do, that there will be economic outcomes that are, uh, provide strength for the nation. And when we look at our lab plan for the year, uh, we talk about things that we believe we're very good at and places where we expect to make contributions. Again, you'll see our signature strengths, uh, science with neutrons, uh, high performance computing, advanced material systems, uh, nuclear technologies, biological and environmental systems, lots of information on uh, climate change uh, developed here, uh, lots of interest in building energy efficiency, as you would expect for an energy lab, and since, uh, particularly since 9-11, uh, lots of emphasis on compelling global security challenges. Now, a recent addition to our lab agenda is this box you see on the bottom, and that's maximizing impact. Uh, to clearly state at our top level agenda, that there's an expectation that the research that's done at the National Laboratory will result in impacts that will make the nation stronger both uh, militarily and uh, economically. And we are a Department of Energy Laboratory. Uh, that gives us a set of tools for engaging with the private sector. And I've identified four here that are the primary tools that we have. Uh, if you'd like to partner with the National Laboratory, uh, one of the key methods is a Cooperative Research and Development Agreement, or a CRADA. Now, this is a tool that allows uh, private sector companies to partner shoulder to shoulder with the scientists at the laboratory and in many cases use uh, funding that's available through federal programs to uh, cover our side of the uh, of the collaboration. The expectation with the CRADA is that our scientists and your scientists will work together and that the result will be greater than, than had they been working individually. Uh, you hear a lot about technology licenses. Uh, that's a, a 
path where our scientists have created new intellectual property that can be protected either with a patent or with a copyright, and then put into the hands of a private sector partner for the purpose of creating new products and services, particularly in the United States. We have the Work for Others and the new ACT agreement, both of which are vehicles that allow companies to engage with the laboratory and fund research specifically for the company's purposes at the lab. So this is a place where the company writes a statement of work, our scientists and engineers deliver the results, and then the company takes those results and uses them uh, normally to create new products and services. And perhaps uh, uh, the biggest and least talked about program is our user facility program. Uh, many of the national laboratories have large facilities that are more significant than anything that you could put in a normal site or in a normal university. Uh, here at Oak Ridge, we talk about our spallation neutron source, our high-performance reactor, and our high-performance computing systems. Uh, these are facilities that are available for the world to use. Uh, we have uh, committees that will receive proposals from uh, research groups that would like to come do work at the lab and then uh, select those that have the most scientific merit. And if the uh, researchers are willing to publish their results, then uh, they can have access to these world-class facilities at no cost. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about the Oak Ridge National Lab intellectual property portfolio. Uh, as you would expect with a, uh, a laboratory with a diverse uh, research focus and diverse funding, uh, we have a broad range of uh, intellectual property that is available. Now as you would also expect for a national laboratory in the energy space, energy and utilities is our most significant uh, chunk of our portfolio. Uh, we also have significant uh, intellectual property in materials, and that ranges from nanomaterials to bulk uh, alloys. Uh, we have uh, significant intellectual property in healthcare and biology. Uh, most of the work that we do in that space these days is related to, uh, to renewable energy. We have uh, significant uh, intellectual property in uh, IT and communications. Again, a large part of this is related to high performance computing and large data and analytics. Uh, we have a portfolio in chemicals. Uh, we'll focus today on our portfolio on analytical instrumentation. Also, we call out security and defense, manufacturing, transportation, and detectors and sensors. Now, again, the topic for today is analytical instrumentation. And we've segmented that into about a dozen different uh, pieces. The big ones are mass spectroscopy, uh, chemical detection, and scanning probe microscopy, and then others that we have are medical imaging, optics, temperature measurement, and it goes down the list. Now, mass spectroscopy, I think is one of our more interesting technologies because you can trace its origins all the way back to the Manhattan Project days where we were using mass as a way to separate isotopes of uranium. And the idea is that you can uh, pull into the system uh, a sample. In, in the early days, it was samples of uranium. Today, it's samples of just about anything that you can, that you can ionize. Uh, you distribute it or divide it up with a nebulizer. Uh, then you ionize it. And then uh, when you have a charged ion that has mass, then you can run it through a magnetic field and separate the individual particles based on their mass. And Oak Ridge has a broad intellectual property portfolio primarily focused on the sampling or the, the front end of the system. Uh, we have sampling systems for high throughput and automation, uh, a number of uh, sampling methods and tools. Uh, we have a handheld mass analysis system that actually has been commercially licensed. We have ultra high resolution systems and we have uh, other systems for detection. And in addition, we have additional capabilities in uh, proteomics and peptides. Now here's a, a highlight one of our capabilities. Uh, on your left, you see a surface sampling system. And then an interesting uh, uh, target for this system was a, a thin slice of, I believe this was a mouse or a rat. And the idea is to be able to do high, resi high spatial resolution uh, assays across the sample. And then as a function of space, determine what kind of component you have. And uh, if you look at the intellectual property portfolio associated with this, uh, lots of work on liquid microjunctions. We have atmospheric pressure. Uh, laser desorption and ionization, thermal desorption and ionization, and you can see the rest of the ones on this list. So mass spec is a historic strength for the lab and an area of ongoing research. Another area of interest is chemical detection. And interestingly, since 9-11 uh, and since we were concerned as a nation about having military foes who would potentially have chemical warfare agents that we would need to be able to identify, there have been a great deal of effort in designing systems that can detect chemicals of interest from a distance, or this is called standoff spectroscopy. Oak Ridge's significant contribution in this space is the development of a multi-laser system, in particular a, uh, a system that operates in the infrared and has finely tunable lasers. And the notion is that you, you stimulate the, uh, the space that you're uh, testing to see if there's a chemical present uh, with, a, with a variety of wavelengths. 
and then you look for the response that comes back. And if you, if you have enough wavelengths to probe with, then you can develop unique signatures for different kinds of chemicals, and it gives you the ability then from a distance to, to probe a surface area and determine if a chemical of interest is present. And we have systems that are designed for, uh, for handheld devices that uh, uh, survey surfaces that are a few centimeters away uh, to large military systems that are able to survey systems that are, that are kilometers or more away. In addition, Oak Ridge has significant uh, ongoing strength in uh, micromechanical systems as chemical sensors. And you can see in the upper right here that we have uh, uh, what we call microcanalevers. You can think of them really as miniature uh, uh, micron or submicron scale diving boards. And these diving boards can be coated with chemicals of different types that are receptors for different types of uh, compounds that you're looking for. And you find that as compounds attach to these receptors, uh, that the, uh, the diving board or the micro cantilever will actually deflect. And you can measure that deflection either optically, as you see on the, uh, the image to the lower left, or you can find that they will deflect dynamically if you put a, a frequency through them, and then you can see how the resonant frequency changes. And you can see on the right that there have been uh, a number of systems developed for these cantilevers uh, that's a relatively mature technology. And one interesting recent application has been to use these micro cantilevers as a vehicle for doing infrared imaging. And the goal is to be able to use the same detector to uh, do an infrared map, so you can have a physical map of what you're looking at, and then do uh, chemical sampling as well, so that you can then have uh, an image and then superimposed on that image is a spectrum uh, that gives you Im information about the composition of the, of the uh, object being imaged. We also do quite a bit of work in scanning probe microscopy. Uh, the notion with scanning probe microscopy is that you drag a micro or nanoscale uh, mechanical probe over the surface of interest, and then again using something like a laser uh, reflected onto a photo detector, attract the deflection of that probe in order to map the surface. And at Oak Ridge, we've done quite a bit of work in uh, optimizing the probes and in fact adding functionality to the probe so that in addition to doing a surface map, uh, you can also uh, uh, measure the chemical composition of the surface that's being, being studied. So that's a quick survey of, uh, of our analytical instrumentation portfolio. Uh, I hope you'll take a moment to go look at our webpage. It's ornl.gov slash partnerships for more detailed information about these technologies uh, and for uh, information about the rest of our portfolio. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Bruce Warmack. Uh, Bruce is the developer of the Smart Smoke Alarm, which is our feature technology. Uh, Bruce has led an effort to uh, build a prototype. I think you'll be excited by the results that he has, and it's one of the things that we're really excited about here at Oak Ridge. So, Bruce? Great. Thank you very much. I'm uh, really excited to be here and to tell you about um, a technology that I've been developing over the past few years. Uh, for a number of years, I, I've been involved in uh, uh, um, developing sensors of various types for various applications. And the, uh, a few years ago, the U.S. Fire Administration and the, uh, uh, the Consumer Product Safety Commission uh, came to us and asked us if there were a way to uh, improve the performance of smoke detectors uh, with new sensors that might become available. And I, having uh, been in the field for a while, I surveyed that and found that uh, there were a number of sensors that were possible, but trying to get those online uh, in a durable uh, fashion uh, uh, in a cheap, low power sense uh, was going to be a difficult job to do in the short term. Uh, so we took a different approach. We decided to uh, educate the sensors that we could get our hands on now that were already well proven in the field and uh, to teach them how to sense uh, hazards in the home better than, uh, than they had been just with simple threshold alarms. So uh, we're, we're talking about a technology of a smart smoke alarm that detects fires sooner with fewer false alarms than present home smoke alarms, but at comparable unit cost. And so what we do is that we intelligently combine one or more sensors using an advanced mathematical algorithm to more accurately and rapidly detect fire conditions. And what we use is a technique called linear discriminant analysis, which is used to distill data from hundreds of intentionally set residential fires and nuisance tests that have been put out and carefully recorded. And so what we want to do is give inexpensive microcontrollers that you can find in uh, 
today's, uh, many of today's uh, smoke alarms, to give them a map to recognize real hazards from ordinary and nuisance conditions. And so <clears throat> what we, uh, uh, our motivation really to look at this field is, is pretty high because since 1975, the number of, of deaths due to home fires has been cut in half. And that is due to the, uh, to the uh, performance of these smoke detectors, which came online at, at that time. But nevertheless, we've still got a lot of danger uh, left to, to, uh, to work on. In 2012, there were several hundred thousand residential fires. 2,400 people lost their lives. And even in recent years, there's, it's been as high as about 3,500. 12,000 injuries, property losses in the billions. And so you can imagine that uh, uh, insurance companies would be very interested in knowing uh, how to reduce that for, for their property losses. Certainly homeowners and anyone who's interested in safety is, is, can see this as a very significant number that, that can be attacked. Uh, residential construction techniques have, have changed. Home furnishings uh, have changed to synthetics and foams that have decreased safe egress times from an average of 17 minutes in 1975 to only about three minutes for flaming fires in 2008. And lastly, alerting occupants is sometimes troublesome. Uh, studies have shown that up to 70% of children from 5 to 15 don't wake uh, awake soon enough to the high-pitched alarms that are in uh, uh, home fire units uh, right now. And so putting a lower frequency unit in there is one of the things that we've discovered from the literature is very beneficial in alerting occupants. And that's why uh, firefighters like uh, Captain Gary, Captain, uh, Gary Watlock came to, to me and, and said, when is this going to be available? Because uh, uh, this is a technology that we really need. We've got good smoke alarms, but we can make them so much better. Um, so what we're using is an advanced discrimination technique. Uh, we've in, the, in years past, we've built a number of analytical instruments that look at multiple channels of data and decide from the, from the patterns of data what's going on, what the environment looks like, what chemicals are present. Uh, for example, the chemical and biological mass spectrometer, the CBMS, uh, was designed for the Army and their fields of operation to detect chemical agents and um, uh, other hazards uh, for the armed forces. This is a mass spectrometer, and so it has multiple channels of information that an ordinary soldier would not need to be bothered with to analyze all that and be a trained analytical chemist. But he needs to know what chemical hazard this, this data means. And so this uh, uh, discrimination techniques that we used in that allowed him to instantly read what hazards were present. Uh, we built a, uh, a set of electrochemical and, and uh, mobility spectrometers uh, for, the, uh, for the DHS to help support first responders know what kind of toxic industrial chemicals are present in the, in the uh, atmosphere. And this uses an entirely different set of sensors. These are electrochemical. Uh, nevertheless, the, the same kind of a discrimination technology can be applied to that. We've even looked at a little handheld unit using uh, discriminant uh, analysis and uh, uh, using uh, differential mobility spectrometry, and uh, have found it useful to sort out the chemicals and ticks that it's been looking, uh, that it's been, uh, uh, looking at. So all of these techniques are fairly expensive units, uh, have, um, uh, uh, have been developed with different kinds of data, but they all make use of a linear discriminant analysis for classification using multiple data streams. Uh, so what's in a smoke detector nowadays? Well, we've got two kinds of detectors. Uh, the ion detector is the most common, uh, and a photoelectric detector. The ion detectors, uh, most people, uh, many people know, are more sensitive to smaller smoke particles, things you can't see too well, and uh, they, they respond to fast flaming fires that, where these uh, aerosols are produced. And what happens is they've got a little bit of americium that ionizes air, and when smoke particles are present, those ions get trapped on the, uh, on the smoke particles. They drift slowly, and so the voltage on the, on the output signal changes uh, in a significant way so that you can see the presence of the smoke particles. 
Uh, photoelectric detectors, the one on the right, has a flashing uh, pulse light source, an infrared light source. And when smoke particles are present, those scatter light into a detector, which can be picked up. The photoelectric detectors are more sensitive to larger aerosols and typically pick up smoldering fires much better. Some of these particles you can't see, like burning uh, toast, for example. Your alarm can, can go off on, the, on that material, uh, but you can't even see it. Larger particles, the smoldering smokes, you can see those are larger and uh, are more uh, akin to the, to the wavelength of light that, you're, that your eye is picking up. Um, so let's look at some fire test data. This, we looked at some data that was recorded a few years ago at UL and the National Institute of Science and Technology. They intentionally set a number of fires in rooms and in homes, uh, in manufactured homes, and uh, <clears throat> uh, recorded data using ordinary smoke alarms and sensors that picked up carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, the obscurance, uh, aerosol uh, characteristics, and that sort of thing. And <clears throat> so what we're, what we're doing is taking that data, it's a rich treasure trove of data, and teaching our sensors what a real fire looks and smells like. So we use a, there, there's typical, uh, typically several kinds of uh, mathematical analyses that you can uh, uh, take a look at multiple channels of data in an unbiased sense and just determine the variations that are important in recognizing uh, the important features. Principal components analysis, uh, some people have, have, may, have, may have heard about or used in the past uses uh, many channels of, of data, you can take that in, even thousands of channels of data. But the goal of PCA, principal components analysis, is, is to capture information about data variation. It gives you a lot of information about it, but it doesn't necessarily lead to a good classification picture. What we've found for our chemical analysis is that linear discriminant analysis is very superior because the goal of LDA is to classify or discriminate in a mathematically optimized sense. So you have a bunch of data and you teach it, this is a fire, this is a nuisance. It can tell the difference between those, between those two. Both involve going into an abstract space called virtual space or discriminant space. And what we need to know is what that space looks like, where the, where the hazards are. And if we're near one of those hazards, then the sound alarm appropriately. So here's just a simple uh, linear discriminant analysis. Uh, we've taken training data from UL. Uh, we've, we've got an ion sensor, and then we look at the rate of change of the ion sensor and the rate of change of temperature. So we've got two sensors providing three signals. And we have uh, th with those two tests that I showed in the previous slide. Uh, we've taken that and transformed that in, into discriminant space. And this is two-dimensional discriminant space. We have uh, linear discriminant coordinate one on the on the abscissa, and a linear discriminant coordinate two on the on the uh, on the orbit. Uh, and in this area in the lower left quadrant, this is a normal region where most of the sensors tend to locate when the, when they're in, in normal conditions. For one one of the flaming fire for one of the fires, we had. Uh, a smoldering condition, a, a couch that was uh, uh, smoldering. And you see as, this, as the time progresses, it, uh, it, it has a, a character in the upper uh, left quadrant that is non-flaming. Uh, and uh, on the, on the right-hand side of the, uh, of the graph, we have flaming conditions. So, th so if we look at uh, just the time progression of a Let's say this coffee maker, this is a particular test that caught this coffee maker on fire. It suddenly went into flames in uh, just, a, just a couple of minutes. And it, it, the timeline goes from normal, near the flaming condition, and then beyond. And so we know to sound the alarm when it's, when it's closer to the uh, flaming condition than it is to the normal condition. Uh, for the for the ponderosa pine, this is non-flaming, so it's smoldering. It has an entirely different character. Uh, all we're sensing now is temperature, the ion um, reading, and the, change, the rate of change of the ion reading. 
and we see an entirely different character here. So we, we can tell the difference between flaming and non-flaming fire. It doesn't really matter. You, you're going to turn the alarm on in, any, in either case, but we gain more information about it. Now, if you look at what happens with a, <clears throat> with a combination smoke alarm, a good smoke alarm will have both the ion and the photoelectric present. And we found that, uh, that the ion would sense this fast flaming condition in three and a half minutes. The LDA actually performed better two and a half and 2.2 minutes. Uh, with the smoldering fire, this took a long time to develop, 45 minutes or so it took before the, uh, either the ion or the photoelectric detector sounded. Uh, the LDA uh, discovered this a few minutes earlier. Than that. So we, in both cases, we beat the conventional alarms and with, the, with just a simple uh, linear discriminant analysis picture. Uh, so let's, let's go to a little more complicated picture. Instead of two dimensions, let's make this three dimensions, and that's actually what we're working now uh, in, uh, in three dimensions of lin linear discriminant space. So each of these axes is, is uh, uh, linear discriminant one, two, and linear discriminant uh, coordinate three. And so normal condition is the green colored timeline. It's closest to the normal condition when it's colored green. Uh, we've painted an area near the nuisance, uh, kind of a brown shaped color. And then as it goes toward the smoldering area, it changes to a gold colored uh, character. But we can sound the alarm as soon as it gets out of the nuisance category and into the smoldering category. That occurred 53 minutes. That sounds like a long time, but the conventional alarm took 90 minutes to discover that. So we're already ahead uh, 30 some minutes sooner, and that gives you that much, uh, much better safe egress time. Uh, here's another uh, alarm. Uh, again, a smoldering chair in, in, in a living room. It goes uh, from normal to nuisance, it thinks. It's, a, it's not sure that it's a, it's a fire, it could be a nuisance. Uh, but it alarms at 34 minutes. The conventional alarms at 87 minutes, even better uh, performance. So that's, that's what we're looking for, is, is to discover what dimensions we want to carefully um, examine to decide whether we should sound the alarm or just keep quiet and say, well, it's, it's just a nuisance. Um, here's a much uh, uh, faster condition. Uh, <clears throat> in this case, this was a, a flaming mattress in a bedroom. Uh, <clears throat> now, this timeline's much shorter. Uh, the LDA alarmed and a little under three minutes, the conventional alarm, just a, little, a few seconds uh, faster. But in both cases, this, this was a flaming condition. Again, these are alarms, whether it's flaming or smoldering, it needs to sound. And it finally goes into some, uh, some third category we call vegetable oil or grease, which is another type of fire. But in any case, the alarm is sounding all the way along this, all the way along that line. Now, <clears throat> here's a case in which bacon was tested on, on the stove. The conventional alarm, uh, the ion sounded after eight minutes. The photoelectric sounded after 11 minutes. Uh, and that causes people to do strange things, like take the batteries out of their smoke detector. And they, they're quiet after that, but they don't protect you. So uh, we want to avoid that. Uh, the LDA alarm never alarmed. Okay, it was stayed in the nuisance category. It recognized that as a non-fire, non-hazardous condition. And so we want to compare a number of these fires that were tested at NIST and at UL. And so what I've done here, this uh, it's a fairly busy uh, axis in the bottom, but uh, along this line are a number of test fires uh, uh, picked up by sensors from different distances from the test fire in different locations in the home. Um, these commercial smoke alarms still use threshold levels. When the smoke gets above a certain level, it knows to sound the alarm, whether it's toast or whether it's, a, uh, whether it's a real flaming condition. But in fact, most alarms are false alarms. Uh, and that's, that's very troubling because it does tempt people to do the wrong, uh, give people the wrong idea about how to, how to quiet this thing. The, spa, the smart smoke alarm uh, gives us faster detection and in fact, more complete elimination of the, of the uh, false alarms. Now here we, on the left, we have a series of smoldering fires. 
and we're plotting the difference between the time at which a commercial alarm sounded and, and the LDA alarm. And in, um, for smoldering fires, we're an average of 13 minutes faster. In fact, in some cases, we're, we're uh, as much as 40 or 50 minutes faster than, a, than the best uh, combination smoke alarm on the market today. Uh, for flaming fires, the performance is going to be about, about the same. Uh, it's a little hesitant to call the alarm until it knows that it's a, it's a real fire. Uh, it's, 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 uh, the, uh, the average is about uh, is, is right on, on, on par with the conventional alarm. But in nuisances, it's reticent to, to, uh, to uh, cast an alarm out. In fact, this was uh, an average of 37 minutes uh, slower. And in fact, uh, more than half of the nuisances were completely suppressed. They never went off. But in all cases, the nuisances uh, are triggered uh, at least more slowly than the, uh, uh, than the conventional alarms. Um, and this, the, uh, the case that I just showed is just with a photoelectric alarm, a photoelectric sensor, a carbon monoxide sensor, and temperature. Now, you know when, when, when a real fire happens, you're going to get smoke particles, you'll get carbon monoxide, and you'll get temperature changes if you're close to the fire. Uh, in the case where we've added an ion sensor, uh, we get similar performance. Uh, it's a little faster to pick up the flaming fires. Uh, in fact, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an average of just, just a bit earlier. Uh, nuisance rejection is similar, maybe a little bit worse, because the ion is, is a little nervous about uh, some of the aerosols that come out. But even when we take out uh, two of the sensors and just have a photoelectric and temperature sensor, we still get good performance on the smoldering fires, uh, 10 or so minutes uh, uh, faster on average. We get reasonable, reasonably good performance with the flaming fires, and not so bad with the nuisance. Almost half of the nuisances are completely rejected, but in all cases, they're slower to react. Um, in fact, if you even go down to just one sensor, a photoelectric sensor by itself, you can get um, uh, better performance with smoldering fires. And that's, that's a fairly important feature to have. Now, how do you get better performance out of one sensor? Well, you, get, you have two signals to work with. You can, have the, you can have the photoelectric sensor and its rate of change. And that, that gives a signature that's distinctive for smoldering fires, for example. So this is our present prototype. Uh, uh, I, have a, uh, I have one with me, and I'll show you at the end of the talk. But uh, this is a, a, a prototype that we put together. Uh, we designed a circuit, a PC board, and we actually uh, took sensors from commercial products. So we know they work. They work well. And we've tuned them up to be able to, to sense the signals that we want to see. Uh, the carbon monoxide sensor, for example, is, is very useful for toxic alerting. But toxic alerts are something above 70 ppm for carbon monoxide. We've tuned it up so we can see 1 ppm of, car of carbon monoxide changes. And uh, that's very important when we're looking at incipient fires that, uh, that produce a small amount of carbon monoxide, very much below the danger level, but very telltale for, uh, for picking up uh, uh, smoldering fires, for example. This, this looks like a conventional alarm. It's about the same size. It alerts more quickly, as we've discussed. Um, and we built prototypes. We've uh, actually printed these with a 3D printer and, and mounted the board. Uh, the algorithms are embedded in this tiny little microcontroller. This is a, uh, a Texas Instruments controller that's, that cost about a dollar or less in quantity. And uh, so we've embedded the, these complicated mathematical algorithms in a little cheap uh, microcontroller. Uh, and programmed it for various kinds of sensors. Presently, we can take up to six sensor signals and three dimensions of data and handle all, all that in a, in a chip that, that costs about a dollar, so pretty impressive. Um, the low frequency alerting is what we've added uh, to give us better uh, uh, alerting for, for many occupants, particularly children and the elderly or disabled, various types. We found from the literature that uh, 
that a number of fire deaths occur while people are sleeping in their homes and they don't wake up. Arousal is limited by uh, sleep deprivation, by alcohol, drugs. Uh, as we said, children, old age, the hearing impaired, for example. The, and what's embedded in the, in the uh, old smoke alarms now is a 3100 hertz T3 alerting tone. A high-pitched tone that not everyone can hear as effectively as a low-frequency tone or a female voice, as it turns out. Uh, you can imagine a uh, female voice waking up children uh, who are in danger. And so they, they will alert to this sort of thing. So taking a 520 hertz square wave, it has a number of, of uh, uh, frequencies that are harmonics. And those f frequencies are separated, as I understand from the, uh, from the researchers who did this work, uh, spaced far enough apart that it stimulates the ear and uh, better get, you, get your arousal. So this is a, another optional feature that can be added to get uh, everyone up and out of the, out of the uh, hazard zone more quickly. Uh, we've done some, uh, uh, a few tests with our uh, smoke alarm. We, we anticipate going to Underwriters Laboratory and doing a complete suite of tests. But here's a prototype in which we had photoelectric carbon monoxide and temperature sensors. And I intentionally set it up very close to the toaster, only about four feet away. You would not do this with an ordinary alarm. In fact, it's recommended that you go to uh, about 20 feet away from uh, recent sources in the kitchen. So we're very close to the, uh, to the toaster. And we successively to toasted this uh, piece of bread until it's charred black, as you can see. Uh, the first toast cycle is a light toast. And it, it stayed, uh, this, this is a nuisance level. So it went into a nuisance level, and then as it cooled down and uh, it recovered, uh, it went back to normal. Uh, second toast cycle, and you get the same results. The third toast cycle, now we're starting to see a lot more particles and even a little bit of carbon monoxide, but it's still no, it's, it's hesitant to call this a fire yet. But by the time it really burned and charred the toast very black, we've got a lot of particles, a lot of carbon monoxide, some temperature changes, and it goes into, it, it uh, oscillates between uh, flaming and then finally smoldering, and so it goes into a smoldering uh, alarm uh, for, for several minutes. A conventional alarm, uh, by the way, 20 feet away, alarmed twice during the testing. And so we we're trying to demonstrate uh, the effectiveness of nuisance rejection. So here's a, here's a market opportunity that, that we see for uh, trying to get this technology uh, out, into the, uh, out, out into home. We estimate the market about 20 million units annually, or maybe about $500 million. And since the technology is adaptable for even single sensor units that are very common nowadays, uh, we can embed this uh, intelligence uh, with little incremental cost. Uh, none of the market really is, in, is excluded here. We don't have to have a very high-end unit to start out with. But of course, higher performance units are likely initially followed by a progression of lower price units to replace outdated designs. Uh, the standards for fire detection are improving, and that's good news. But it means that sensor manufacturers are going to have to put more intelligence into their, into their alarms um, so that single sensor units are unlikely to pass future standards. Um, the awareness of uh, carbon monoxide risks that uh, people uh, have nowadays uh, will help drive models that have the carbon monoxide sensors, and that just helps us to detect fires uh, and toxic hazards all at the same time. So uh, uh, there's my contact information. If anybody would like to, like to discuss this technology with me, I'd be glad to entertain that. And uh, let's see if I can give you a... Uh, Get back on camera. This is a uh, this is a smart smoke alarm that we've that we've uh, produced here and printed. Uh, it has a speaker on the top, as you can see, and in this case we've got a carbon monoxide sensor, a photoelectric sensor, and a little thermistor that measures temperature changes. When it goes into alarm, this the loudspeaker will give you a uh, 520 hertz signal 
that is much better at uh, <coughs> responding uh, or alerting people to uh, the fire hazards. So I'll be glad to uh, take questions. Anybody has any? One question that's been sent in is, how does the ORNL smart smoke alarm differ from other commercial systems that address nuisance alerts? Well, manufacturers are getting, um, uh, getting on the bandwagon of, 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 of trying to educate smoke alarms. Uh, one manufacturer has, has in fact coupled the carbon monoxide sensor to an ion sensor. Uh, and uh, when, the, when the carbon monoxide sensor gets above a certain level, then it makes the ion sensor more sensitive. So it's, it's, a, uh, it's an early form of intelligence. Uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, uh, advanced algorithms that we can employ really optimize that and don't, so they don't burden the engineer with trying to figure out well, what level threshold level should I have? How do I combine these sensor signals? The mathematics does that for you. And so it does it in the most complete sense that we can. So, this, so we think this is going to be a much superior method, but it really doesn't cost any more to employ. Another inquiry is, when will these units become available, and how much more will they cost? Well, I'd like to say they would be available tomorrow. In fact, we have a few, but uh, Oak Ridge National Lab is a research lab. We don't manufacture uh, items, and we're not allowed to compete with, with industry. What we want to do is, is to encourage technology along. So we want to teach manufacturers how to exploit this, and that's, that's one reason we're coming through the technology transfer office, is to attract manufacturers to get this um, uh, technology into their own products, customizing the software to their own sensors and uh, making their own custom products that they can be proud of. Uh, this may take, um, uh, ideally, it would take a, a year or two. There's a lot of testing and development that has to, has to go on, testing and verification at Underwriters Lab, marketing and so forth. So it's it's not likely that it's going to be on the market uh, within, well, let's say, a, a year or two, but hopefully by then. And, and I think will, will it cost more? Uh, it depends on how it's, uh, how it's put together. If you put more sensors in, you're going to have to pay for each sensor. But the intelligence can be put into a simple microcontroller that ordinarily is used for operating the uh, smoke alarm in any, in any case. So the really, the hardware doesn't have to change. And I think we have time for one more question that we've received, and that is, how or can the software in these units be upgraded when new fire test data becomes available? That, that's an exciting possibility. In fact, one manufacturer is, is connected to the Wi-Fi and can upgrade or change the operation of their units. It's, there is there's a distinct possibility that uh, manufacturers could exploit uh, the latest fire test data with, uh, with their sensors uh, and uh, upgrade the units in the field. Right now, we have a programmer that uh, when we get new test data, we can just uh, we redo the uh, uh, discriminant algorithm and can embed that in the microcontroller. Uh, but it's possible to do that by Wi-Fi. Internet possibilities. Well, Bruce, thank you very much. So this concludes the first. Uh, Invention to Innovation webinar series, our webinar. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you hope you've found some opportunities to perhaps work with the lab. Uh, we do have, if we could switch back to the slides, five more of these events scheduled. Uh, we hope you'll join us for future events. And again, the URL for, uh, for registration is at the bottom. Once again, thank you very much for joining us, and I hope you have a great afternoon.